In February of 1957, when police officers received a tip about a random cardboard box lying on the side of the road, they didn't know that the discovery would become a mystery that would shake their town and the entire country for decades to come. The body of a young boy would be found stuffed inside the box, and his identity would remain a mystery for over 65 years. This is the story of the boy in the box and the murder of Joseph Augustus Zarelli. I'm Ashton, and welcome to The Haunted Corner. Welcome back to The Haunted Corner. Another new week, another true crime, unsolved mystery for you all. This is the murder of the boy in the box. This story has always stumped me. And if you've been following the news recently, then you know that this sweet boy was identified in December. And he's no longer known as America's unknown child, as he was so long referred to as. He once again has a name, and it's Joseph Augustus Zarelli. This is his story. Let's get into it. The story begins one cold February evening in 1957. A young man who was checking his muskrat traps discovered the box of a baby bassinet laying near the side of Susquehanna Road in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As he looked inside the box, he noticed the body of what appeared to be a small child. Knowing that the muskrat traps he set were illegal, the man decided against notifying authorities at the time. A few days later, a college student named Frederick Benesis was in the area when he saw a rabbit run under a bush. When he got out of his car to investigate, he saw the same discarded cardboard box that the young man had seen a few days earlier. Something compelled him to open the box, and he discovered the body of a young boy. He, too, hesitated to notify authorities at first, but he eventually built up the courage to do so. Authorities would eventually poke holes in his story and realize that he was actually in the area because he was spying on girls in their rooms at the time. Gross. Authorities arrived on scene and found the nude body of a young boy, approximately four to six years old, wrapped inside a blue blanket in the box. The boy had a very short, crude haircut with clumps of hair left, and the hair appeared to have been cut shortly before the boy was discovered. Authorities initially believed that the boy died from malnutrition, starvation, and exposure to the weather conditions. However, they soon discovered that the boy appeared to have been beaten to death because he had bruises and abrasions on his face and body. It would later be confirmed that the boy had died from blunt force trauma to the head. The boy had sealed surgical marks on his groin and ankle as well as an L-shaped scar underneath his chin. The boy had blue eyes, and his hands and feet were wrinkled and appeared as if they had been submerged in water at some point near the time of his death. The crime scene was combed over by 270 police academy recruits who discovered a man's blue corduroy cap, a child's scarf, and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G in the corner. All of this evidence really didn't lead anywhere. The, they were able to trace the blue hat back to a shop, but unfortunately the person who bought the hat had paid in cash, which was very common at the time, and so they weren't able to trace that back to a, a person at the time. The boy had not been reported missing, so the authorities had very little to go off of to identify the child. They took the boy's fingerprints in hopes that they could be used to identify him. 
the Philadelphia Inquirer printed 400,000 flyers depicting the boys' likeness, which were sent out and posted across the area, and were included with every gas bill in Philadelphia. The focus turned to the cardboard box that the boy was found in. Investigators determined that the box was for a baby bassinet and was purchased at a J.C. Penney store less than 20 minutes from where the body was found. The shipment of bassinets had been received on November 27, 1956, and sold for around $7.50 between December 3, 1956 and February 16, 1957, from the J.C. Penney store in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. The store was able to confirm that 12 customers had purchased bassinets, but unfortunately they all paid in cash, so it made it near impossible for them to trace. The investigation became the search for America's unknown child. A recreation of the boy's face was completed and distributed in hopes that someone would come forward with information about who this boy was. At first, investigators were optimistic that the boy, that the boy would be quickly identified. Someone had to be missing this boy, but who was he? Theories began to swirl. Investigators followed the few leads that they did have. One of the theories that came up was that the boy in the box was the child of a carnival worker named Kenneth Dudley and his wife, Irene. According to reports, the couple had 10 children, and in 1961, an investigation was launched into the family when their seven-year-old daughter turned up dead from malnutrition and neglect. They didn't bury her, but instead they wrapped her in a blanket and placed her in the woods just off Route 1 near Lawrenceville, Virginia. In total, the Dudleys killed seven of their own children, but they were eventually ruled out as the parents of the boy who was found in the box. Another theory was that the boy was a foster child who lived in a foster home approximately one and a half miles from where his body was found. In 1960, Remington Bristow, an employee of the medical examiner's office, who pursued the case until his death in 1993, contacted a New Jersey psychic who told him to look for a house that matched the foster home. When the psychic was brought to the Philadelphia Discovery site, she led Bristow directly to the foster home. Upon attending an estate sale at the foster home, Bristow discovered a bassinet similar to the one sold at J.C. Penney. He also discovered blankets hanging on the clothesline that were similar to the one in which the boy's body had been wrapped in when they discovered him. Bristow believed that the boy belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the foster home and that they disposed of his body so the stepdaughter would not be exposed as an unwed, unwed mother. This theory eventually fell apart the police were able to confirm that all the foster children were accounted for, and a re-examination by police, investiga police investigators concluded that family members were likely not involved. The final theory came from a woman named Martha, or M. Martha claimed that she grew up with the boy in the box in her mother's home in Philadelphia. She claimed that one day in 1954, her mother purchased the young boy from a man and brought him to live with the family. She claimed the boy's name was Jonathan and her mother forced the young boy to sleep in the cold basement. Martha claimed that the boy was murdered by her mother after he vomited on the floor of the basement. She claimed that her mother beat the boy to death and disposed of his body. Despite this shocking claim, there was no evidence of a young boy living in the house during that time. There was no evidence that connected the boy in the box to the family or the house at all, and neighbors disputed Martha's claims. So all of this, in addition to Martha's history of mental illness, led the police to abandon this theory. America's unknown child was originally buried in a potter's field. 
1998, he was reburied at Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedarbrook, Philadelphia, which donated a large plot for the boy. It was during this time that authorities gathered the boy's DNA for hopeful identification using new DNA technology. For a long time, no one knew who this sweet boy was or what really happened to him in 1957. The case went quiet until almost 66 years later after his initial discovery. On December 8, 2022, Philadelphia Police Department Commissioner Danielle Outlaw announced a breakthrough in the case. The boy in the box had finally been identified and given a name. Joseph Augustus Zarelli, and he had been identified thanks to genetic genealogy. The boy's DNA was uploaded to genetic databases, which led detectives to relatives on his mother's side. After pouring through birth records, they were also able to identify his father. It was then learned that Zarelli's mother had three other children. The investigators found that Joseph Augustus Zarelli was born on January 13, 1953, which meant that he was four years old when his body was found. They explained that numerous questions still remained about his life and death. For now, they're not releasing the names of Zarelli's parents out of respect for his living siblings. They also refused to speculate on who killed Zarelli but they did say that they have their suspicions. They said, quote, this is still an active homicide investigation and we still need the public's help in filling in this child's story. This announcement only closes one chapter in this little boy's story while opening up a new one, end quote. And that's a quote from the police commis commissioner, Danielle Outlaw. There's still so much that we don't know about what really happened to Joseph, but this is a huge step towards finding out who killed him and why. Just this last Friday, January 13th, 2023, on what would have been Joseph's 70th birthday, he was given a new headstone at Ivy Hill Cemetery that includes his name now that he's been finally identified. And hopefully one day they're able to finish his story and find out what really happened to him in 1957. And that is the story of the boy in the box and the murder of Joseph Augustus Zarelli. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. The sources for today's episode will be listed in the show notes and also on the blog post for the episode at www.thehauntedcorner.com. Check out the other episodes of The Haunted Corner, available now wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, with new episodes dropping every Monday and Thursday. If you're over on Patreon, you're getting three episodes this week, so stay tuned for that. If you haven't subscribed on Patreon yet, head over to patreon.com forward slash The Haunted Corner to get access to exclusive content available right now. Thursday's episode is available right now on Patreon, as well as the exclusive episode for January. So head over there and subscribe at the $1 per month level on up. If you join at the $5 per month level, you'll have access to an upcoming episode a week early, and you'll get an exclusive The Haunted Corner sticker after donating for three months, plus a lot more. Follow us on social media at The Haunted Corner on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. If you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to tell a friend. If you have a case suggestion or a correction to share, please send it to thehauntedcorner at gmail.com or submit it through the website. Until next time, be kind and take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next time. Bye.